Hey everyone, my name's Ted. Welcome to my garage. In this video, we're going to talk about why I'm going to be doing an electric fan conversion on my Holiday Rambler Endeavor diesel pusher RV over there. I decided that I wanted to make a video talking about why I was going to do this because I've posted about this on some of the RV groups I'm on and I've gotten a whole lot of uh, I don't want to say backlash necessarily, but definitely a lot of criticism, negative comments, people saying that it just can't be done. One person went so far as to say, it's impossible, ask an engineer. And I'm an engineer, so, uh, okay. I, I, so I found that comment funny. Um, so <clears throat> first off, what, am, what, what are we gonna be doing here? Currently, the factory cooling system on this RV, which has a Caterpillar 3126B engine attached to an Allison 3000 transmission, it's a rear radiator setup and it has the the factory cooling setup has a single big mechanical fan it's direct driven there's no clutch moving the same amount of air relative to engine rpm but it's always going to move the same air regardless of the coolant temperature the outside air temperature whether you're going up a hill down a hill doesn't matter and what it does is it then routes pushes that air through a charge air cooler, or as we tend to call them on cars, intercoolers, then through the radiator and out the back. The radiator then sends coolant through the transmission cooler, which is a liquid to liquid heat, heat exchanger, and the transmission feeds its fluid into that heat exchanger. And then after that, it goes to the water pump and the water the first thing after the water pump in the engine is the oil cooler uh, and then it goes to the rest of the block so inherently the biggest negative about this design is that you're you've got a fan that is never changing its airflow for any reason other than engine rpm and you know if you're driving on a cold day versus on a hot day you don't necessarily need all of that air um, other than on the very hottest of days, what I have found is that the engine actually runs colder than it's supposed to. I have 190 degree thermostats in there, which is what Caterpillar specifies. And Caterpillar says really 200 is the ideal temperature to run at. And I'm seeing it run at or below 190 most of the time. Um, now this is after a couple of changes I've made. but. The big problem with this mechanical fan, from my perspective, is that it takes a huge amount of horsepower. And you're doing some rough calculations to figure anywhere from 20 to 50 horsepower at normal cruising speed, which for the for an engine that makes 330 horsepower, you figure 10% 10, 10 is not um, unreasonable to guess. So that's a lot of horsepower that could be put towards other things. Sometimes, yeah, you do need to flow that much air, but for the times that you don't, which is most of it, um, you're you're really wasting that horsepower, and that means worse fuel economy, that means you're working the engine harder, means your acceleration is slower, means that you have less power available for going up, of, up hills. And I wasn't 100% happy with how the whole system worked in general, so over the past year I've been doing a lot of changes that have been kind of leading up to this point. Um, so we're going to talk, talk some about that. Um, to address the concept, the idea that this is not possible, uh, th that's just wrong. Um, you know, if you, if you consider the idea that Tesla is able to make electric motors that are propelling their cars to 0 to 60 in whatever, 3, 4 seconds, I forget, it, the ability to have an electric motor that can produce that much airflow is, it's there. Now, from a practical standpoint, you're not gonna to wanna to put one of those on the RV. That would be an enormous electrical system draw. But by optimizing things a little bit better, you can get to where you don't necessarily need to. And one of the things with the mechanical fan is that you know, fans, fans are optimized at a particular RPM. And when you have a mechanical fan that's spinning with engine RPM, it's gonna have a design point that it's optimized for, and it's gonna be less efficient outside of that. So with electric fans, you can have a design point and they can run at that design point. They can run slower than that design point too, which is part of what I'm gonna be doing with a variable controller. But 
there's there's a lot of inherent efficiencies with electric fans and that's part of why when you take a look at pretty much every modern vehicle today uh, they they all have moved to electric um, a lot of that's come from fuel economy regulations and things like that but sometimes as much as people like me don't like those regulations sometimes there's a benefit so if you're thinking okay this sounds interesting first thing I want to point out is that you cannot just go and slap fans onto your existing setup uh, for one maybe you can but on mine you certainly could so the first thing I did and I have a video of this from a, from uh, months ago is I had changed the electrical system it had a single 160 amp alternator I changed that to two alternators one puts out 200 amps the other one puts out I think it's rated for 320 amps or no 280 amps something like that um, but they both had dyno performance better than what they're spec'd at, so I have approximately 500 amps of electrical power uh, available from the alternators. That's the first thing. You need to have enough electrical power to draw these, because, to, to handle this cooling, because these fans at max are gonna draw about 100 amps. That's a lot of power. Uh, the other thing is, I, I do tend to agree with the concept that you probably are gonna have a hard time making electric fans in a practical standpoint without spending a ton of money, that will flow enough air. And so then to work with that, I, I was also finding that I felt like the trans cooler was undersized and I also felt like the oil cooler, uh, the factory oil cooler was not keeping the oil temperature uh, as where it should be in an optimal situation in the summer on long grades. Is it necessarily damaging? No, but I wanted to, I wanted to work on that. So I have another video where I show what I did for the transmission, which is I basically eliminated this stock cooler. It's still there, uh, but now it's just a pass through for the coolant. And so the transmission has its own coolers uh, actually kind of in the middle of the bus. The other thing that I've done, and I'm gonna make a separate video about this, is I made a separate, a friend of mine helped me make a sandwich adapter for the oil cooler uh, there's nothing commercially available for this size, um, but so we, he helped me get machine it out of aluminum, ran some big hoses, and now I've got an external oil cooler. So the stock factory oil cooler is still there, uh, somewhat to my dismay, which there's another story on that. But uh, so basically what I'm doing is I'm adding additional oil cooling and because of the routing of the oil, uh, this actually is secondary. The external oil cooler gets the oil after the factory oil cooler. So what that means is that most of the time this probably is not going to be doing a whole ton necessarily. Uh, but for those days where the stock oil cooler is not able to keep up, it will help keep the oil cooler, which ultimately is going to mean less heat rejected to the cooling system, to the coolant, because if the stock oil cooler is only able to keep the temperature to say 240 degrees. That still means that you've got that significant temperature difference between the coolant and the oil. And so it's not able, so you still have heat transferring from the oil to the coolant. If this secondary cooler is able to get the oil back down to a temperature similar to the coolant, or maybe even actually a little bit cooler then depending, um, then that means that you're not gonna have that heat transfer and maybe you'll even have a little bit of reverse and so maybe it will actually use the oil to help cool the coolant a little bit. Um, remains to be seen, we'll see. So what, I've, so what I've done with this is essentially I've removed or at least significantly reduced, but I think saying removed is probably a, a safe bet. I've removed two of the significant heat, uh, heat source, sources that were getting fed into the coolant which means that the radiator now only has to worry about the engine. Uh, the other thing, if you watch my video about removing the radiator and intercooler, uh, mine were really bad. They were really, really clogged. I was definitely not getting very good airflow through them. I, and I suspected that already, but once I started to take a, once I saw how bad they were when I pulled them out, it's kind of amazing to me that I wasn't having overheating issues. So I'm going into this with trying to set myself up for success with this as much as possible. Um, new radiator, new inter intercooler, both of which are completely clean. Um, 
I've eliminated two significant heat sources that were feeding into the coolant. So now I'm allowing the cooling system to just focus on the engine. Um, what I'm doing is I'm using uh, two sets of fans. Uh, each one is a set of two 16 inch fans that was designed for a, I think 2005 to 2007 Suburban or Escalade. So each one would cool up to a 300, 340 ish horsepower LS V8 uh, in a Suburban or Escalade. And I mean, I'm gonna have double that cooling flow. And then what I've done is I'm using a separate independent um, temperature sensor and computer that will control some fan controllers to allow variable speeds of the fans based off of the needs of the cooling needs of the engine. Um, and there's and I'll get into that into my in my next video. So when you take a look at this on the whole, I am reducing airflow. The mechanical fan probably flows around 20 to 25,000 CFM when I did some calculations. These electric fans to, to, uh, all combined should be about 12,000 CFM, but then I've got about another 3,000 CFM of airflow with the oil cooler fan and the trans cooler fans. I've also set myself up to have the most efficient radiator possible, and don't forget that I have reduced my horsepower load significantly. Um, these electric fans are going to, even when you factor in the amount of power that the alternator has to produce and the horsepower draw on the engine that comes with that, um, th this is going to be less horsepower draw. So I, I'm pretty confident that this is going to work. Um, will it need some tweaking? Yeah, probably. But I, I've set myself up for success with this. Now, if you want to think that this is just not possible, like I said earlier, it, it is, but, it, but there's OEMs out there that are doing this. Um, Prevo has put electric fans on their buses. They have a much more complicated system than this, but the general idea is, is similar. Um, and they claim a 4% fuel economy improvement, which is huge. Uh, I'm sure that there's also a horsepower improvement as, as, that goes with that as well. Uh, if you look at transit buses, um, when we were just in New York visiting my mom uh, for Thanksgiving, all the transit buses, you can actually see the dust outlines where the electric fans uh, for the side mount radiators are blowing. Uh, this is this kind of concept is used in modern buses all over so i really don't see a reason why the concept itself can't work and i've tried to make sure i have things as overbuilt as i reasonably can while also being uh, reasonable cost wise and i think hopefully in the video you'll see that so if you liked this uh, don't forget to check out the other video uh, that's going to be coming later about the actual install and i'll have some follow-ons about showing how it's worked. Um, if you still think that I'm an idiot, then uh, that's fine. Um, and uh, I won't buy you anything if you're right, and I won't ask you to buy me anything if I'm right. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.